Hello, my good friends. Let me first tell you how terribly sorry I am that I cannot be with you. It would have been so much of a pleasure to see all of you again, especially when there is such a very nice event as 15 years of Cielo. But unfortunately, due to many circumstances, I cannot be there. However, I agreed with Abel that I will give you a few messages from here that I really believe in and that are relevant for our long-term collaboration. You see, even now, someone is Skyping me in between. Um, so, let me first start by saying that since we first met, a lot has changed. Many of our dreams that we had together for so many years to bring science in developing regions in the mainstream can now be realized because the technology has made enormous strides. So my lecture is called Knowledge is like love, it multiplies when shared. And this relates to my inaugural speech earlier this year when I became professor in Leiden. And I think that I added today specifically for the 15th anniversary of Cielo, that this also works against and across the digital divide. So let me start in the next slide by our old paper, 2008. And as you can see there, there is several of the people that are in the room, co-authors, Abel and Katie, but also Jimmy Wales, whom I met for the first time at an organized conference by uh, Abel, was one of the co-authors. And we had high hopes that we would start the first successful community annotation site for the life sciences. And as you can see here, the paper was highly cited, Old Metrics is doing great, but hardly anyone has been able to realize it, and also we couldn't. One of the reasons was this was very much associated with the company and I've become a big believer in doing this all in the public sector only. So if we go to the next slide, I want to give you my second message. Not only is it very difficult in the past to do community annotation, but the point we made, a million minds, is still there. Because if we look at the complete set of uh, assertions we have made together in the life sciences, we come up to probably around 10 to the 14th assertions, call them nano publications. If you take the redundancy out, so every single assertion is only once in your graph, you come to a graph of about 10 to the 11th cardinal assertions. And if you then cluster those by subject, like you see here on the picture, Huntington disease on the left and a gene that we predict to be associated with Huntington disease on the right, then you come to about a million nodes, as we discussed in that 2008 paper. We are now doing all our research based on this. So each of the little assertions that end in the middle of each of these pictures is one cardinal assertion supported by one to a large number of nano publications, one single meaningful statement. And obviously to come to the point where you can decide whether the gene you see here could be really involved in Huntington disease, there are all these concepts in the middle that are highly complex. None of us will know them all. And we need mobs or scientific mobs on mobiles to get people together to make decisions on this. This is the new way of e-science. And how can a country like Brazil or a region like yours fully participate? Well, in the end, I will even tell you to take the lead because you have several advantages as you will discuss at the end of my message. The next slide shows you what I see as the new paradigm of e-science. In the past, people would do largely exploratory reading. They would read papers, formulate a hypothesis, do an experiment, 
publish the results in narrative with a few tables. As we all know, that time has long gone. Nowadays, we generate enormous data sets, see patterns in those data sets that you can only see from a helicopter view. If you would walk in the grass, you wouldn't see it. From a helicopter view, you see the contours of a Roman fortress. And now you have to land and do what I call confirmational reading. Deep digging into the literature, into databases, supplementary data, tables, much of which currently eludes text mining, for example. So and even if we would mine the entire available explicito that is in PubMed or in any other publicly accessible and readable format, we would still miss the vast majority of the assertions that are important for knowledge discovery. So, if we want to contribute to e-science, we have to bring all information from narrative, tables, supplementary data in computer accessible and processable format. And then the computer, if we see these radiculograms, I stole that term from Larry Hunter, that are huge complicated patterns in big data, we would zoom in on things that interest us and that might contain what I call actionable knowledge, and then we go back to the literature to read. That is the future practice. And now community annotation also comes a lot closer. Why? There are four, that's my next slide, message four, four major forces. As I just said, the giga size of data sets goes simply beyond narrative. I just spoke to the editor of Cell and she told me that the average number of assertions or associations with the Cell paper coming in now is 50,000. There's no way to describe that in narrative. We were recently involved ourselves in a paper that would contain 160,000 nano publications in the uh, uh, supplementary data if you would publish them all. So the second force, if we go clockwise, is that the computer reasoning or computer massive analytics takes charge. So unless we create formats that can be used by massive computer reasoning, most of our reading stuff will go unnoticed. Then there is this very lucky and welcomed movement towards open access. And I was always a very strong open access fan, as you know. But one nuance I would like to make specifically in this audience. I get more and more irritated by people that pretend that open access is morally superior to the old system. It is simply another business model. The polluter, we, the scientists, pays. But in the past, when I was in Africa working on malaria and with you guys in Latin America as well, the big complaint was we couldn't read, too expensive. Now, is publishing becoming too expensive? So what is worse, not being able to read or not being able to publish? Obviously, we all strive to get full open access of all data that are not constrained by privacy or proprietary issues. So let's work on that together. I think the latter part is giving you the most enormous scientific advantage over our region in the north. And that is the collaborative intelligence that we came back to in our paper in 2008. And I still want to push very hard today, although it's a rocky road and it's very difficult. But we have to recall, and now literally call with mobiles, on a million minds to annotate what I call the explicitome, the entire body of explicit knowledge that we have produced so far. And that brings me to my last slide. Maybe the one but last, let me think. Um, yeah, this is message five anyway. So here you see shallow 15 years in the middle and the four forces that I discussed before. First of all, if we go from reading to consulting, because if you remember the two nodes that were crossing 
paths, there is no way to start even reading on the connecting concepts. You have this incredible asset, Plataforma Lattes, where all these CVs are, and you can work on making a knowledge of all the experts in the region, so you know who to ask, to ask what about any pattern in big data. Unless you find a way to enable the enormous power of that asset for e-science, you really miss the boat. Then the other thing is, if you go again clockwise, there is more and more reasoners over big graph data. And if your data are not in these graphs, like brain is just one of them that we have produced, but there will be many more soon, then computer reasoning will miss your data. And even if you want to keep, in some cases, the text, the narrative, from which nano publications may be derived behind a firewall for confirmation or reading for money, you can still publish the individual nano publications in open access because they are ultra ads for your text. People will want to come back to the text and read, do confirmational reading. Why I would believe this individual isolated assertion, this triple, this nano publication. So what was the essay? Under which conditions is this true? Do I believe the methods? All these kinds of things can never be captured in any computer readable format of sorts that the computer will sort it out. So in principle, text and nano publications will both be needed for the future. Then, if we go to the last panel in this slide, you'll see that there is already this movement to nanopublications, which is essentially nothing more than publishing assertions from text databases and data sets in computer-readable RDF with very rich provenance, so that it becomes citable and traceable. Obviously, if we map as we said for years between us, all terms, whether they are in Portuguese, in Spanish, Chinese, or any other language, and even in the language that used to be used for um, scientific communication, mainly in the 20th century, which is called English, uh, then if we map all these terms to UUIDs, universally unique identifiers, that are computer resolvable, the language barrier for all documents coming from your region will be gone. And we have been drumming that beat forever. And to be honest, I'm disappointed in two sides of the digital divide that we have not yet taken full force to beat this challenge. And let's go for it. Let's do this as a commitment at 15 years of shallow, in which you can be very, very proud. And don't get in the mood of following what these guys in the north are thinking up. You are, for many years, and I said that at the first Quicks meeting I ever was, the one I, where I met Jimmy and Jan Veltrop, and I'm still grateful to Abel for bringing us together. You know, you are far ahead of Europe in many ways and of the United States. Take that lead for the funders, fund it and be proud of your continent with all the achievements that Cielo, Bireme and others have achieved so far. Abel, I thank you very much. I congratulate you and all your teams around you with this enormous achievement. And I'm very proud to say that Abel will join us in January for a very important workshop to start and realize a globally accessible fair data trading environment called Fairport. Abel, I cannot wait to meet you there. And again, I'm very, very sorry that I cannot be there in person, not only for the science, but the other thing I always remember, obviously, is the dancing, the drinking, and the party. Again, 
All the best, have a great meeting, and hope to see you all soon. Hello, my good friends. Let me first tell you how terribly sorry I am that I cannot be with you. It would have been so much of a pleasure to see all of you again, especially when there is such a very nice event as 15 years of Cielo. But unfortunately, due to many circumstances, I cannot be there. However, I agreed with Abel that I will 